O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, uh, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Uh, G'day, welcome to Central Church's online service uh, for this week. It's great to have you with us and what great words to start with, to, to see God in his majesty, the one who is enthroned, the one who is the name above all names. And we are here to worship him and not simply because he is the great God and the creator of all, though certainly that is enough, uh, but also we worship him because we know he loves us. And we want to respond to him in love as well. So thank you for joining uh, today. My name's Scott Muir. I'm the senior pastor at Central Church in Ipswich. Uh, We are a church in the heart of the city of Ipswich and we have a heart for the city of Ipswich. Uh, So thanks for joining us today. Um, Especially if you are somebody who's a bit new to us, we'd love to get to know you. You can connect with us uh, through just scanning this QR code here on the screen next to me. We'd love you to do that and uh, it'll just open up for you a a little digital connect card, just some details you could fill in so that we can be in touch with you and work out how we can best uh, care for you and serve you. If you've been with us for these last few weeks, you'll know that we've been tracking our way through a a new series. Uh, It's called I Google God. We're exploring the kinds of questions that people who are, are searching for spiritual answers, those kinds of questions that they might have. A lot of people are searching and it's easy to turn to Google. We want to turn instead to God's word and to see what he says to us. And today our question is the third one there. What does God think of me? I wonder if you've ever wondered that. Uh, Maybe you've asked that question in another context like what does he or she think of me? You've been on a date And afterwards, you've gone, I wonder how that went. I wonder what he or she thought of me. Maybe you went to a job interview. A little bit scary, but uh, the the man or the lady who interviewed you, and you're wondering afterwards, of course, well, I wonder what they thought of me. Uh, Maybe you had an audition for something. How did I go? (laughs) We can be a bit insecure, can't we? Wondering how we're perceived by other people. The more important question In fact, one of the greatest questions that we need to ask is, well, what is it that God thinks of us? And the great news is that we don't have to guess because God has told us. And we're going to look into that a little bit later on as we dig into his word. Uh, But for now, before we get there, how about we just spend a little bit of time praying? Please pray with me. Our Lord and God, how majestic is your name above all the earth? You are our creator and majestic one. And we come before you today because you have, uh, because you have ordained praise. You are the powerful one. You are the sovereign one. You are the majestic one. You are the, the one who has power over all this earth. You are the one who has power over our lives. And yet you know us intimately. You love us deeply and you've demonstrated that love to us in Christ. The Lord Jesus was the one whom you sent to be that atoning sacrifice for our sins. While we were your enemies, while we were separated from you, still you have reached down in love to us. And for that, we're forever grateful. Father, we come before you as people who are repentant people, knowing that there is still that Uh, that heart of sin within us. There are still thoughts, deeds, actions each and every uh, week that we uh, know we are guilty of before you. Um, Father, we confess our sin. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you wash us clean of our sin and that has been accomplished through the blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, revealing truth to us in a world of of lies where uh, people and uh, others will say to us things which are not true. We want to hear your clear voice about what is true of us. And Father, we pray just especially too for our world, this world that you have made. And we know, Lord, there are people who are hurting and grieving, people who have uh, sicknesses, 
uh, physical and mental, uh, Lord, we want to pray for them. And Lord, you, uh, each one of us knows in our hearts and can name in our hearts people close to us who might be suffering at this time. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would comfort, you would heal, you would pour out your, your grace and that each one of them would know your nearness to them at this time. And Father God, we want to pray for our city in Ipswich. Lord, we pray uh, that many people might turn to, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and put their trust in him. And Lord, we want to pray boldly for revival. And Lord, for, for the, the newness of life that comes when your spirit is poured out in people's hearts. And Lord, the change and the transformation that brings, how precious that is. We who've experienced it uh, know the beauty of it. And Lord, that, that that would be the experience of others is our prayer. Would you please do that work? And would you please use us as your people, your church, uh, to be those who share that grace with others? Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to, even in this online format, to be able to come to you and to pray to you, to, in a, in a sense, uh, share some commonality together, though we might be in different places, yet still we are one in the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, read the Bible. The passage I've chosen today that uh, we'll, we'll just read is Ephesians chapter 2. So the New Testament book of Ephesians, uh, Paul's letter there in chapter 2, just from verses 1 to 10. Uh, if you've got your Bible, love for you to turn that open. Otherwise, it will be on the screen here next to me. Let's read God's word. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Uh, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And, this, and raised, up, uh, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, gracious God, you are rich in mercy. You are full of love. And we're so thankful for that. As we explore this topic today, Lord, help us not to just kind of be looking at ourselves, but more importantly, be looking at you, be attentive to your voice and to hear your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, look, it's a really important question. What does God think of me? What does God think of you? It's a question that goes to the very heart, I think, of who we are, our, our identity. That's the word we use a lot these days, isn't it? Our identity. So I want to just start there for a second because I think it's going to help us lay a foundation for how we're going to answer this question. Now, in sociology and in psychology, there's a lot written about the nature of personal identity. Um, I've been reading uh, this book, uh, just in the last little while. Um, but it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by a guy, a guy named Carl Truman. And so look, armed with expert knowledge, um, I've read half the book, uh, let me dump on you some things that I've learned from Truman. Indulge me for just a minute because I think this is really helpful about this question of, of identity. 
what Truman does is he explains that throughout most of human history, people have looked outward for their sense of self. Um, uh, they've, by that he means that they, we've grown in our sense of who we are by living in relationship with others. We've got a sense of, uh, of us from our environment and from our culture around about us. In doing community life with others, we learn who we are. We, we become who we are by, by working our way into that culture, by fitting into that system. And so we think of ourselves, therefore, often in relationships and in relationship to others and the categories that other people can understand. Together we have values and ideas of what is the good life and, and how to reach that good life and together we pursue that good life. And so when someone in, in this way of thinking asks, well, who am I? Well, I would talk about the kinds of things that uh, people can relate to. I, I'm Beck's husband. Uh, it's a big part of who I am. My family relationships are a part of my identity. My family connections are meaningful to me. Uh, same with what I do at work. It's another expression of how I'm looking outwards. So I would say, well, I'm the pastor at Central Church. Um, here I get to be with people and I have conversations with people about the common life we share. And, and that continues to form me in who I am. I, I get shaped as a person, seeing what's good in me and nurturing that, but also seeing what's bad and having that exposed through community and having to deal with that. So, so that's the outward look. And that's how a our sense of self has been thought of for thousands and thousands of years. But in the last 50 years, my lifetime, there's been a shift in all of this. And instead of looking outwards to find our sense of self, the modern person looks inward. And so the modern person thinks, well, we find out who we are by giving expression to what's inside of me. I give expression to my feelings and my desires and discover who I am inside of me. Who we are can only be discovered, therefore, by this inward turn. And in this context, well, what's out there, my workplaces, the institutions of our culture, well, those things exist to serve me and to help me in my sense of inner well-being. Uh, Truman points out that in the modern way of thinking, what's inside of me, uh, what, sorry, what's outside of me isn't there to help shape me or to form me into something different. It doesn't want to change me. It ought not to change me, uh, even to make me better. Those things out there are places, or the people out there are places, where my sense of self has to be affirmed. And the great moral wrong, of course, is to, to say or do anything that could be interpreted as not 100% affirming a person's sense of self and what's going on inside of them. My happiness, therefore, comes from being able to freely express who I am and to be accepted for it, good, bad, and ugly. It's the inverse of the looking outward version. Uh, this, he says, is the rise of the modern self. All that to say, then, that we've kind of got these two ways of arriving at a sense of self. We look outward to our culture, and people around us, and we learn our sense of self from there, or we look inward to our inner heart and discover who we are internally. Someone once helped some, helpfully summarized it a bit like this, that the historical way is like a river. Each person is, is taken along with the flow of others. There's something kind of comforting about that. We're moving in the same direction together. It, it's kind of simple, the hard stuff has been worked out for you by others, so go with that. The modern way is like an ocean though, and you're swimming in this ocean. Uh, you're doing it alone, you can go in any direction that you want, but for many that becomes overwhelming and leads to this personal crisis of just not knowing. And, and it's true, isn't it, that you're more likely to drown in that ocean than in a river. But are those the only two options? I want to suggest to you that there's another option, in fact, a better option. It's a little bit like the first in, the, in that it rejects the inward turn. It sees the danger of diving inward, but it calls us to look further out than simply the voices of the culture and the people around us. This other way, of course, is a, is a look upward, to listen to the voice of God, to hear 
a clearer and more authoritative voice, the voice of the one who made you and who can speak truth to you. This way, is, this way isn't just a river where you, you go along with others, nor an ocean where you're completely unsure of which way to go. It's more like a mountain spring of water that satisfies your thirst for meaning and a sense of who you are. How do we get to it? How do we drink from this spring? Well, we drink to it by drink of it by hearing the voice of God in the Bible. And that's what we're going to do today. The things I'm going to highlight today are the things that are, are true from God's word, the things that God says about all of us, um, Christian or non-Christian alike. I want to address everybody here. So Christian or non-Christian alike, what does God say to us? Well, firstly, God says, I made you, <laughs> you are mine because I I made you. The very first chapter in the Bible explains where we came from, not from nothing, but from the creative hand of God. Genesis 1, 27. So God um, created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, I'm not going to spend too long on this because I talked about this in the, in the first talk in the series. But, but just a really important reminder here that you're not an accident of nature. You're created you belong to God, therefore, and there's something special about belonging to him. The same verse, Genesis 127, tells us something else. It tells us not just that we were made by God, but that you were made in God's image. You are, therefore, like God. A child bears a resemblance to her parents, so we bear a resemblance to God. Uh, we're not gods. Uh, a lot of people act like gods, but believe me, you're not a god. But God made you with the ability to love as he loves. That's something of being made in the image of God. To, to think, to, to rationalize, to feel. All these things are part of being made in the image of God. But being an image bearer is actually, though, bigger than that. You see, in ancient times, so think back to when the Bible was written, when, when Genesis was written, they saw a lot of images. The images they saw were often carved images of national kings. And when a king in an ancient nation wanted to assert his authority amongst his people, he'd have a, a statue or an image of himself erected as a reminder that he was the king. The image was designed to represent him in that place. And that's what the Bible is kind of referring to here when it's talking about us being in the image of God, that we actually get to represent God in the world. Human beings are given a special place in God's world to to care for it on God's behalf. Third, God says, you're significant. Could be easier to think, couldn't it? That, well, look, God's got a lot on his hands. There's a lot going on in the world. Does he really, do I really matter? There's a whole universe out there to keep in check. But the Bible reflects on this. Psalm 8, it says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place. What's man that you, uh, that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. See, King David wrote this psalm, this song back in the Old Testament. And his, his mind is blown by this very fact that God is not only the God of the whole universe. He sees all, he knows all, he does all, he controls all, but he also cares about human beings. And Jesus basically said the same thing, but kind of took it from a different approach. Instead of looking at the vastness, the, the hugeness of the universe, he looked at the very fine detail, that every detail is under God's control. And the example he uses is like the sparrows. And so he said in Luke 12, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God. Why even the, very, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more value than many sparrows. See, get, get the point. God's got all the details. And again, you might think, oh, he's got to control every detail, every bird. But you're more precious to him than that. You're more valuable, more significant. You matter to him. But more than that, you're wonderfully made. That's the next thing. A great Psalm, Psalm 139 speaks of this great to read the whole psalm but let me just give you some highlights from verse 13 for you formed me you formed my inward parts you knitted me together in my mother's womb i praise you for i am fearfully and wonderfully made 
Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the, of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there, were, when there was none of them. They're pretty precious words, right? Isn't that incredible? It should make us kind of blush a bit that, that God should say such wonderful things of us, that, that God knit us together. Well, if you get that, that image of, of knitting, yeah, it's fine finger work, isn't it? I don't think my fingers would, would cope with it. It's fine finger work, intricate. It's, it's intimate handiwork. And God has formed you like that. Fearfully made, wonderfully made. Every one of us ought to be able to declare those words. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But I reckon a lot of us would feel pretty uncomfortable saying that. We look at ourselves in the, in the mirror and we focus on all kinds of things that God's not focused on. Too short, too fat, too skinny, too bald, too mentally broken even. And we believe that well, we can't be any good. We believe the lies that the world tells us. Other people would say about us. We do well instead to listen to God. To let him speak truth to us. Uh, uh, but there's more. Let me go back to Psalm 8. You're also the crowning glory of God's creation. At verse 5 of Psalm 8. You crown him, human beings, with glory and honour. I think that's a bit like you know, talking about the image of God again. But, but saying, therefore, that you have a special place in creation. As God's image bearer, you have honour, you have dignity, you have value. In a world that says your worth is about things like how, how good you are, how smart you are, uh, how successful you are, how rich you are, uh, your physical appearance and how good looking you are. Those are the things which, uh, which the world counts. But God says, no, you have worth because I made you. And I made you special. You are the crowning glory of my creation. There's something special about that. And the last thing I'll mention is God says these words. He says, I love you. A God who is love has a deep love for people, the ones he created. One of the best verse, known verses in the Bible declares this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves. God loves you. And his love is a perfect love, an unconditional love. It's not about your performance or how good you are or how successful or how rich. He loves you because he made you. Now, all that sounds great so far, right? <laughs> you're created, you're like God, you're significant, you're wonderfully made, you're crowned with glory, you're loved. But... There's something else really, really important that you need to know. And that is that you're a sinner. And sin is a problem in your relationship with God. You know, God made us as the crown and glory of his creation, but we have shamed him. God created us with great honour, but we have dishonoured him. We've done this by not listening to him. We've decided we know better and we've done what has pleased us instead of looking to God and, and what pleases him. And God says that's the case for all of us. This verse, Romans 3.23, is pretty hard, isn't it? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. We've fallen short. We haven't lived up to the glory of God. And so when... You're asking this question, what does God think of me? Well, if I'm going to honor, honestly answer it from what God's word says, I've got to say God thinks you're a sinner. Well, he says it outright. You've dishonored me by doing what you want instead of what I've said is best for you, and that is sin. Uh, Ephesians 2, the passage that we had read to us here earlier, it, it, it comes at us double-barreled here at the beginning of Ephesians 2. You were dead. Paul says, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, 
following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, get this, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. It's like, wow, <laughs> fearfully and wonderfully made, yep. Yeah. Crowned in a position of glory, uh, yes. Significant, yes. But dead in your sin. Following the way of Satan, not the way of God. And that makes you a child of wrath. It's a way of saying you are headed uh, for disaster. That's kind of sobering, right? That, that brings us down to earth a bit, right? That, that's... That ought to be humbling for us when we think about God and what he thinks of us. But it's not the end of the story. The next word in Ephesians 2 is wonderful. Underline the word, but. There's all this bad news about sin, what it does to our relationship with God, but. The word but tells us there's something better coming. From verse 4, look at it there with me. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, up, uh, raised, us, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here it is, isn't it? But God being rich in mercy and having boundless love, even though you and I had been the ones who'd stuffed up, see, his love was still there. We were the offenders against him. We had dishonored and shamed him, but his love was still there. What has God done about it? Well, he makes us alive together with Christ. Once dead in sin, but when your faith is in Christ, made alive. And when your faith is in Christ, restored back to that place of honour with him. See, what it's saying is that you don't have to remain in that place of being under the wrath of God, where God looks at you and sees a sinner. When you become a Christian, God removes your sin and your shame and he restores you. And in fact, he does something beautiful. He says, you become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it so well. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Isn't that exciting? What does God think? In Christ, you're a new creation in him. The old of the sin, it's all dealt with. The, the, the old ways, the new life of peace with God, well, that's now come. And then what the Bible declares is that then you are adopted by God, a child of God, as part of his family, secure with him, at peace with your creator. Not at enmity, but at peace, free from sin, and free to live a life that doesn't shame God but honors him. But, interestingly, back to the very end of Ephesians 2. When she says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Say that for yourself. Personalize it. I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. That's, that's good news, isn't it? And so, friends, that, my invitation is really that to put your faith in Jesus, to find your identity by looking upwards to him. If you know that you are not yet adopted into that family of God, then today is the day to do it, to, to essentially drink from that mountain spring that I talked about. That's what God allows you to come to him and to drink of him, to hear his voice, the voice of the one who matters most, your creator, and know that he washes you clean of sin he gives you his Holy Spirit. He adopts you as his precious child and he says, you are mine. And, and that's the identity that matters. Child of God, loved by God, secure in God, at peace with God. Not having to run on performance. Not having to, to get your sense of who you are from what others might say about you. Not having to get your sense of who you are from how successful you are. 
not being not being loved and secure only because others say things to you but hearing that voice of God all the time in his word declaring his love for you in Christ I started this talk with some pretty you know, interesting ideas from a, what I reckon is a pretty dense book, that book I mentioned at the beginning, the Carl Tremor book, and all about human identity. Let me shift gears a bit and finish by taking you to another book, uh, a book that's also about uh, identity, but particularly about our identity in Christ. It's a book that's nowhere near as dense. In fact, it's a kid's book. It's this book, and it's called You Are Special. And I reckon adults need to hear the story is even more so than kids. So uh, look, if you got your kids around today, don't tell them that we're getting a kid's story in church, but that's what I want to do. I want to read to you and look, I've done you a favor. I've got you the pictures as well, so you can follow along. Uh, it's the story of Eli, the woodmaker, and the Wemmicks who he made. Let me read you this story. The Wemmicks were small wooden people all of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workmanship sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall, others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of grey dot stickers. Up and down the streets all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars and dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, well, they always got stars. But if the wood was rough and the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemex had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel good. Others though, could do little and they got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always failed. He, when he fell to the ground, others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he feel, uh, fell, he, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. And then when he tried to explain why he had fallen, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him even more dots. After a while, he had so many dots, he didn't want to go outside. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. A few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks who also had lots of dots. He felt better around them. But one day he met, uh, one day he met a Wemmick who was unlike any other he'd met. As she had no dots or stars. She was just wooden and her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers, it was just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it'd fall off. Others looked down on her for having no stars and they would give her a dot, that wouldn't stick either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. Well, it's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go to see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the wood workshop with him. Why? Why don't you go and find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. And he decided to go and see Eli. 
He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had, no, had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. A punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello. The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. A Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little Wemmick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm. The maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the grey dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't need to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wemmicks just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are very special. Punchinello laughed. Me special? Why? I can't walk fast. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know, she told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly. Because she's decided that what I think of her is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you, less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. Oh, you will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come and see me every day and let me remind you of how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as the Wemmick walked out of the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're sorry that we have not listened to your truth, that we haven't come to you, been willing to hear both the good and wonderful things you say, but also the hard things you say to us about who we are. Lord Jesus, thank you that we are new creations because of what you have done for us and that we can find ourselves able to have access to our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father, for your love. Help us each and every day to hear your voice, to look out upward and to drink from the spring that will truly nourish our souls. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Let's just close with the words of the benediction, praying that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you all. Amen.